And uh, this is one of the projects that we worked on recently. It was accepted to CVPR of this year. And uh, it's it's hubs and hyperspheres. So let's see. So just a broad outline of, of this work. Uh, there's basically four major components that tie this work together. So the first of all, we will be discussing um, few short learning, uh, what it is, what the setting is, uh, what the hubness problem is, um, and how the hubness problem fits into into few short learning, why we care, uh, why it is a problem, um, and and what approaches we thought about um, to solve this problem. So there are four major parts. We talk about few short learning, we talk about hubness, we talk about our particular methods that we proposed uh, to mitigate. Um, this problem, and then we, we talk a little bit about the results and yeah, other interesting things that we found. So that's the broad outline of the work. So a little bit on the preliminaries before we get into the method. So few short learning. So imagine you have a pre-trained classifier. Um, this is all all major backbones that people work with are trained on ImageNet. So um, you could have a ResNet 18 or, or some other architecture. Uh, the weights of which are frozen. So this is a pre-trained classifier. And we assume that this classifier has learned certain general visual representations that may be useful for other tasks now that we are given this frozen classifier. So now let's imagine the following setup. So let's imagine a setup where given this frozen classifier, we are asked to um, perform or we are asked to generalize on a novel data set. And the novel data set is a data set which the, the frozen classifier has not seen before. So the training of that frozen classifier has not happened on, on, on these um, classes before. And so, and the other unique um, feature about this, there's some noise, I'm sorry, but um, uh, I don't know where yeah. it's. I guess from, uh, I'm, I'm does not everybody sure, else please, hear it? Please well? uh, mute yourself if you're not not speaking. Yeah. Uh, but do you hear it too? Or okay. Yeah, I heard some some background noise. I thought it was yeah. in your office, but uh... Uh, there's nobody here. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So, so the the new setting is that given this frozen classifier, we have these novel classes that this classifier has never seen before. So that's first. But the next important thing is that you have a limited set of these samples. So you have limited label samples in this setting. Um, and this is why we call this few shot learning is in the sense that you have K label samples per class and K is typically small. It's either one or five. So it's so that then we call it a one shot case or a five shot case. Um, so that's that's the setup, and this is an active research area. So this is, I mean, computer vision research mostly um, in in today's world they, they revolve around you know vision language models and generative models, and and so on, um, and of course large scale models. But a uh, few short learning, and of course depending on how you uh, define things, uh, you know, it, it is semi supervised learning and unsupervised learning as well. Uh, this is a, a plot I found uh, which is interesting from last year's CVPR, uh, and you can see that it is a pretty active, active research area even today. So the transductive case is where uh, we are still in the few shot setting, but there, there are a, there's a particular case where we call it the transductive case. So this is an illustration of the general setup is you have a pre-trained classifier which was trained on ImageNet. The weights are frozen. Uh, it was trained on these base classes. You have a transductive learner, so this is our new few shot classifier that we have. It has support examples, so we call the labeled examples in few shot learning the supports, and it has query examples which we need to actually classify. And of course, the support and the query classes. The pre-trained classifier has not seen before. So that's that's very important. The transductive setting is where we are given the query examples during evaluation. So that's just one particular um, feature of, of this setting. But but the more important feature is the whole setup. All right, so 
now that was the preliminary on on the few shot uh, learning situation okay so now let's talk a little bit about the hubness problem and this is not a new problem um it goes goes back at least to the 70s or the 80s in 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 computer science uh, with related uh, with regards to the uh, curse of dimensionality um and this is a manifestation of of that curse as as bellman used to call it and the the single line sort of motivation of that curse is is that or the consequence of that curse is that strange things happen in high dimensional space um things happen that we usually do not expect them or or points or data starts to behave in certain ways uh, that are a bit unintuitive um and the hubness problem is one such sort of um consequence um of of the curse of dimensionality now to illustrate this let's say that we are in rd space and d is very high and we have this subset of points that we select from the space and for each point we define this quantity here the nkx or the neighborhood and this is the number of k occurrences of each point in that subset so what is a k occurrence a k occurrence is basically you take a point and then you count how many times that point appears in the nearest neighbor lists of other points so you're in high dimensional space for each point you compute let's say k is 5 then you would look at your five closest neighbors and the k occurrence tells you for each point how many times does a particular point x appear in let's say the five nearest neighbors of other points in this subset in high dimensional space so that's the k occurrence um list now theoretically it has been shown that randomly drawing points from a from an iid uniform would lead to a binomial distribution in if if you if you sort of plot this distribution um and theoretically of course you can draw an analogy to setting up um, a graph of of n nodes and then deciding of k nodes uh, and then deciding whether each node in the graph has an edge so you can think about it in that that respect you can also think about it in a, in a coin toss respect but as long as your your sampling from an iid uniform um in the long run you should you should reach a binomial distribution so this is what theory suggests but interestingly as we shall see this is not the case and even more interestingly what happens in high high dimensional space if you compute distances is that some points emerge extremely close to others some emergent exemplar points which we call hubs and in the context of um machine learning or or yeah this sort of um setting uh this was first explored quite a while back it's almost uh, 15 years now uh, when when this paper first appeared uh, and it sort of proposed uh, this problem in the machine learning setting and in that paper they showed that as far as expecting the binomial is concerned you would have it in a case where uh, d is a bit small so d d is the dimensionality in in this plot um but if you keep increasing it we we see a, a large right skewness um in 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 the distribution as you keep increasing the dimensionality and this was a motivating experiment to sort of demonstrate that there are these emergence very rare emergence of such points which appear in the nearest neighbor list of other points many other points and these points were called hubs by by these authors and they showed that this this could be a problem we'll we'll get into that um and they showed the same that if you sample from from a normal instead normal distribution you'll you'll get the same same effect this saw this right skewness and there has been a lot of work done on it since um but there was another um interesting paper almost 10 years ago um that analyzed this from uh, a density gradient perspective um so uh, the surface that you sample these points from that also affects um whether you get this skewness or not and here this is a very interesting plot because this directly gave us the motivation um for exploring hyperspheres is if you see the surfaces that they plotted here over the skewness um you can see for for the sphere it remains low and it remains relatively constant uh, irrespective of what dimensionality you're in 
And this was way back. This was way before deep learning was a thing. This was way back. Uh, this was before few shot learning was a thing. Um, I mean, these were studying fundamental properties in in sort of distributions and geometry. So the connections with uh, deep learning standard research, as it turns out, came much later. So why do we care about all this in the first place? So we have talked about the few shot learning problem. We have talked about the hubness problem. And so why do we care if, if a certain point suddenly appears, starts appearing in the nearest neighbor list of other points? Or put it even more simply, a certain point is, is the nearest neighbor of, of a lot of other points. Well, we care because if you are in any nearest neighbor based, distance based scheme, then you can have or you can imagine a situation like this where you have, let's say, two classes. And if you have a hub as a point, well, you have X as a hub, then you can have a large possibility of misclassifications. Because if this hub belongs to the blue class, and if it appears in the nearest neighbor list of points which belong to the orange class, then you have a large number of misclassifications. And this is why we care. So this is why the hubness problem in the context of few shot learning is important. So this is the first reason. And the second reason, is that in few shot learning, particularly in the transactive setting, you have most of these classifiers use nearest neighbor based methods. Most of these classifiers are distance based methods or in, in some part of their of their formulation, they use a distance matrix. And so they are susceptible to this problem. And this is why we care. And of course, then the next question is how do we mitigate this? Well, recall that we saw this very nice um, invariance uh, of, of the hypersphere as a surface to the skewness of points. And this is very interesting because, of course, intuitively you can think about it in the sense that if you have a cube, you're more likely to have points in the corners, so uh, you can have uh, emergence of hubs there. But if you have a hypersphere, which is a nice smooth surface, you can have some interesting properties. Um, in addition to sort of observing empirically the skewness results here, there are some other interesting properties uh, that you can require. First of all, using the hypersphere is not a new thing in, in deep learning. Um, in the recent years, it has been very popular as a, as a sort of embedding space. Um, and it has been used in, in, in few shot learning in a different setting to initialize prototypes in, in this setting called prototypical few shot learning. It has been also studied in contrastive learning. Um, but the major theme that sort of comes out from all these works is, and, and this is a thing that we also prove in, in the paper, is that if you have the hyperspherical uniform distribution, then you can show that you have an absence of density gradients in all directions. And this is very important because if you have an absence of density gradients in all directions, then according to the um, results in this paper 10 years ago, you will have zero hubness. And that leads us to the method. So we have certain clues here as to how to design a new embedding space that gives us zero hubness, but that also gives us good performance. So we need zero hubness and we need good performance. And, and if we want to require these two things to happen, we need to require two important properties. So the first property is hyperspherical uniformity. And the second property is local neighborhood preservation. So what that means is given this arbitrary space you have, which is your input data space, and given that you want to project it to a new embedding space based on the hypersphere, you need to make sure that local neighborhoods are preserved. And it turns out that the KL divergence is actually a great measure uh, to do this. So the KL divergence has been used pretty much everywhere. It's a, it's a very nice measure to calculate the distance. Well, it's not technically distance, I guess, but it, it, it calculates the difference in distributions. In, in, it's a nice measure to, to do that. And so that's one. So that's what we call the no hub, which is um, we show that the KL divergence decomposes into these two nice properties is we preserve local neighborhoods and we have a uniformity um, um, constraint. But 
recall that at the beginning, we also introduced few short learning with the setting that you do have certain uh, labels, which we call the supports. And these labels can be used as additional supervision. The original method that we use, no hub, it's completely unsupervised, right? We just look at the structure of the data, but you can inform that embedding additionally with uh, these support labels. So we can leverage this information as well in our last function. And, and this method is very flexible because note that this is an embedding method. So there's not a classifier. And why that is important is that we can use this method on top of any other standard uh, few shot learning classifier that's popular today, that's being used today. And um, our results, therefore, we show that our results are, are aggregated over, over six different classifiers. We pick six different classifiers in, in recent years. And we compare against um, recent embedding approaches, five recent embedding approaches. And again, all of this is, is sort of um, standard practice in, in the few shot literature is where you, you either have embedding approaches that improve classifiers or you have new classification rules. So we don't really go against the grain here. We just sort of, yeah, take what's out there and um, yeah, go with it. But also note that we talked about this backbone, so this pre-trained classifier. So we also tested on, on two different um, um, backbone architectures. So we did it on the ResNet and, and, and a wide res uh, backbone. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty sort of exhaustive list of results. Uh, of course, um, more details are in the paper. Um, and sort of the preliminary result that, that we had was we took the simple shot uh, classifier on, and we tested it on this data set called mini ImageNet. And on, on, the, on the green spots here, you see are some of the reference embedding methods uh, that we compared against some of them from CVPR last year, uh, NeurIPS last year. Uh, and we showed that you have, when you have, when you reduce hubness, you can actually improve performance. And both are methods, both are variants. So no hub is the fully unsupervised method and no hub S is uh, the same method, except that you leverage uh, the support labels. And we show that, uh, first of all, that having um, a nice embedding space is, is useful because you can see here, if you have no um, embedding at all, or if you have just the original embeddings, they're not as useful. Um, so first of all, we show that you can have reduced hubness if you use our method, um, and you can have state-of-the-art results. So this was on simple shot and mini image net, but we tested on a bunch of more, uh, bun a lot more baselines. So this is on a Siamese classifier. This is also recent. Uh, and we see uh, improved results, significantly improved results. And these are all confidence intervals here. So they're not, uh, there are episodes and you average over, over episodes. This is on the Siamese classifier. This one was on simple shot. Of course, other classifiers uh, compared to other uh, embedding methods, they're all in, um, in, the, in the paper, if you're interested. So since there were so many combinations of results, we actually did this aggregation, try to find out, okay, overall, how, how do we do? And so here we had the average accuracies on each data set for, um, for our method compared against each embedding method. So now the average is over the number of classifiers that we use. And the score is basically how many times do you beat uh, the competing methods? And we find here in both the one shot and the five shot case that overall our method is, is significantly, significantly better. So that was one part of the story, obviously. So the other part of the story was hubness, and that's how this started. So we also completed the picture in a sense by showing that. Um, so we calculated the, the skewness, and uh, we showed that um, you can have reduced uh, hubness as well on, on the method set that we proposed, the no hub and the no hub S, as opposed to the other embedding methods. So there is a nice interrelation between these two, uh, between these two sets of results that we had. So we we end at the beginning, in a sense, is that we we discussed what exactly. Uh, well, first we introduced the few short learning setup, um, 
but then we we showed that there's this old uh, interesting result uh, in in ge- in geometry which is the hubness problem and we showed how these two things interact with each other um how the hubness problem can affect classifier performance in in few shot learning uh, so so why we care essentially we introduced um a novel um embedding space to mitigate or alleviate this this problem and we showed that if you have uh, if you choose the hypersphere as as this embedding space then um just a simple kl divergence decomposes into two very interesting properties that help you reduce hubness so the first is the uniformity uh and the second is the local similarity preservation which is points in the original space must be close to each other in the embedding space and the uniformity constraints is that you can visualize this as sort of different classes uh points in different classes uh, as getting maximally separated and so it turns out that these these two properties reduce hubness help us reduce hubness but also importantly help us uh, improve performance uh few shot learning constructive few shot learning performance um so we get the current state of the art and uh, yeah we compare against uh, a bunch of uh, modern classifiers and and modern embedding methods um so these are some of the references that are that were useful as you can see from the dates here uh, these are actually old papers that we we started out with but of course some of them are a bit bit more recent uh, such as uh, this one <laughs>